talk to me a little bit about Curly and how you formulated his voice and style for this role. You know, it's weird. Um, this is this is the first uh, time in which an animator. I mean, I've done like cartoon voiceovers before and all those things, uh, in which I wasn't playing myself. Um, and so they actually said, you know, just use your natural voice, which I thought was weird. But um, you know, because the, the the day before, I was that I was that total amateur in the bathroom, like. <clears throat> like trying to go through like my like what's my car, what's my animated voice going to be and that sort of thing um but they they were so cool about it they knew I was nervous and they just said you know be yourself and how would you talk in real life and it shows now now that I see where they were going like this film is all of us in our natural element and I think that's what makes it relatable and that's what makes it authentic is that you know, it, it would be different if I had to use my voice like it. You know, like that sort of character voicey thing. Like it wouldn't have worked at all. So mentorship is a big theme in the film. I want to know for you, what were your early mentors like and what areas did they help you in your development? Um, I, you know, I grew up in a, uh, I grew up in a musical family and my dad was a um, uh, prominent musician of, of his era. He was at like a doo -wopper. Um So by the time I was born in the 70s, um, he was kind of on the first wave of nostalgia. And there's a moment where I was three years old and he introduces me to uh, drummer Bernard Purdy, who's pretty much played on everything. And my dad has me walk over to Bernard. And I think I was, yeah, I was like four years old. And he says, uh, Bernard, I need you to tell my son, how do you keep food on the table? And he just says, the two and the four. And I never understood what the two and the four meant as a four-year-old. But of course, now I get that his immense timekeeping pocket and his emphasis on the two and the four is what kept him in demand. And I, I, I've used that advice and still give that advice now to to people how to stay consistent in your pocket so yeah i've had a lot of mentors in my life but you know i'll say that my dad was probably one of them that's a great lesson and wrapping up i read that you created playlists to help set the music vibe for certain scenes yeah. in the movie what was that like for you it was fun for me because in in real life i like to imagine myself as creative csi so <laughs> I'm the guy that looks for an excuse to make a playlist for any, even if it's going to the supermarket, like I'll sneak in, you know, try to curate the soundtrack to the drive to, to pick up toilet paper or something like that. So um, I will say that uh, when we were talking about the barbershop scene, I, I might've been a little bit too intricate with my questions and asking. Um, but at the end of the day, I'll say that for all the characters that needed music in the background, my assessment was that uh, a lot of people I know, they kind of st start their music development at 14. But I think once they get into their last two years of high school, they become like, that's where the involvement starts. And then the six years after that, be it college or life, that's um, that's pretty much, you know, that's what they stick to. So in curating the barbershop scene, I instantly told them like every barber I know just sticks to their high school music, even if they're 60 years old. So, you know, for this particular barber, it was 1991 hip hop because, you know, it's, it's trust me, every, 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 every barber I know sticks to that, sticks to that lane of early nineties hip hop. Golden era. Thank you yeah. so much. I appreciate your time.